Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. You, you were one of our more popular episodes ever. I mean, yeah, so that, that one was, of our earlier guests too. Yeah, I think, you, I, think 20, I, think, I think you've got some of the most YouTube downloads and so on and so forth. So it's awesome. Oh, cool. Well, thanks for having me on again. Man. I appreciate it. How much time do you have, Ted? As much time as you want. Like awesome. No end. Okay. I've got to, I got to do a consult at noon. So I've got about, I've got about just under 90 minutes. So anyway, um, let me say, Ted, thank you for coming on. Uh, it's a pleasure. I mean, like I said, I think you're, you're just one of the, one of the really great guys out there and common sense. And, you know, you, you really looked at it and I think it's, you know, you're all, you're all kind of business where I, where I got a lot of nonsense with me. I'm, I'm ugly admit, admit that, but uh, it's fun and it drives, it drives a message. And I think it's, I, I, you know, I'm in, I'm in, I'm engaged in a propaganda war and I fully understand that, but let's, first of all, let's just get into it. Cause you just got a book. You got something called the, the PE diet, which is a protein energy ratio diet. And you and William Schufeld put that together and I've read it. And I think it's really great, great advice. I know you guys have it on, on uh, electronic form. It's not in print from my understanding, but let's uh let's talk let's just start with that let's just talk a little bit about the book and then then we get into see where that the, the conversation goes is that okay zach yeah no that sounds great perfect oh yeah yeah well we're excited about the book we're not the only people who have a book out there <laughs> that that just <laughs> so congratulations to you too on the carnivore diet that's an excellent book yeah i mean i highly recommend you know it's kind of i wrote it for i, did, I didn't write it for carnivores i mean I, i've been telling this stuff for three years it's kind of just introduction to people and i think it's more of a you know you know here's what I, before we get into this i i want to just you know this is a problem i think we have and you can agree or disagree but we had gordon guyatt on the podcast a couple of days ago i don't know if you know who gordon guyatt is so if you look up the term evidence-based medicine He's the guy that invented that. I mean, he actually coined the phrase evidence-based medicine back in 1991 in a single author paper. He's, he's credited with that, and he's been doing that for 30-plus years. He's a guy that came up with a great classification. He's a guy that was, was, was a significant part of this Nutrix thing. And he basically, I asked him on the, on, the, uh, on the podcast, I said, what do you think about nutritional guidelines? Should we, do we have evidence to, to, to support what we should do? And he goes, not really. We, the evidence is so weak that we don't have, because we've been relying on this weak ass epidemiology and it's just you, you can't really make any argument anyway but i think at the end of the day uh there are some takeaway points and i think the pe ratio is, is one good one where we can just kind of put a generality out there so having having that com caveat that i don't think there's tremendous evidence out there let's get into what you think the evidence is well no yeah i mean i totally agree with you honestly there's zero evidence to support the crazy guidelines we have now, this 60% carb diet that everyone's eating has no evidence whatsoever. And in fact, honestly, if you change that diet in any way, it's better. So <clears throat> literally any diet you could name or think of is going to perform better than the untested, unproven, zero evidence, standard American diet or whatever we're supposed to eat. And uh, so anything's better than that. And so what I was doing with the PE diet is I'm trying to quantify what exactly is it about every other diet that you could test that's making it outperform what we're eating in this country. Like exactly what single metric would be the best way to quantify things. And, you know, I thought about, well, energy density, okay. Um, energy density is cool, but it kind of falls apart when you look at things like water um, and fiber and things that take up a lot of volume or a lot of water weight that don't really add to satiety at all. So energy density isn't really the whole story and it's clearly not about just not eating carbs or just not eating fat. And the, really the only single metric that I could think of that, that I felt explained what's driving 
um, satiety and energy toxicity and basic success of any diet at the end of the day was this protein to energy concept. And if you look at any diet, even, uh, you know, paleo, uh, low carb, keto, well formulated vegetarian or vegan diet, I think what all of these have in common is that they're leveraging this protein to energy phenomenon. I really think this is kind of at the base of every successful diet out there. I don't think it's about just avoiding processed foods because you could eat some extremely processed um, animal foods like, uh, you know, Greek yogurt or uh, even, you know, cooked ground beef is uh, technically a processed food. I, so I don't think it's about just whole foods. I don't think it's about necessarily zero carbs or zero fat or anything particular like that. But this protein and energy phenomenon really seems to explain a hell of a lot. It probably doesn't explain everything, but I think it's the closest we can get to a single metric that explains the power of any diet that beats the standard American diet. Yeah, Ted, I think uh, just looking over your stuff and your, your ebook and everything with that, I think what you said, what makes sense to a lot of people and what I would agree is it's the, certainly the simplest way. Like if you're looking just to kind of stay the course and not have a lot of derailments along the way and not have to like navigate too many logistics and too much planning, I think when you account for protein, you're kind of you're going to get into that spot. And I think the science more or less backs that up from, a, from just a, the thermogenic effect of protein versus carbs and fats, as well as just the satiety factor with, with, with protein as well. And then the next thing that I find kind of interesting within this is, uh, I'd be curious what your thoughts on that, because the counter to some of that is like, well, yeah, but fiber can kind of do a similar thing in terms of satiety. Is there a science or evidence that you've seen that actually shows yes or no with fiber having long-term satiety effects versus maybe like a short window of time after you initially consume it? We definitely have some <clears throat> evidence to support satiety in the short term from both fiber and water. But if you look at any longer time scale, there's really zero satiety there at all. Uh, if if that really worked, we'd all just um, take a Weight Watchers meal and blend it in a gallon of water and throw in some cotton balls or some sawdust and just <laughs> eat that all the time. It would be the most successful diet ever. So fiber and water completely falls apart um, on any longer time scale, which is why I don't really buy into the energy density um, uh, concept because Sure, if you eat, um, like eating a whole fruit with fiber and water outperforms drinking juice, for example, sure, in the short term. But for any longer term satiety picture, fiber and water just doesn't really explain much at all. And uh, so there's a little bit of something there to fiber and water, but it's just not, it's really not explaining much in my opinion. Is, is that kind of an issue of if someone's not actually consciously tracking how much they're eating within the context of that framework that ultimately if they load up on fiber and water to fill their stomach, they're just going to overeat down the road because their hunger is going to come back kind of twofold, so to speak? Right. I don't think it's going to give you, uh, I think the long-term satiety from your sawdust and your gallon of water is going to be zero. I think that's just going to be an epic fail at the end of the day, you know, figuratively and literally you're still going to be hungry. So yeah, I have a huge problem. And, and like you said, this is probably the simplest, the very, very simplest single metric you could look at with any diet. I think that a lot of people could agree. And if you look at every single diet study that's ever been performed, human, animal, uh, in any any category of diet study and uh, looking at any parameters whatsoever, protein percentage is probably the single most important if you're talking about ad lib eating. Now, if you can tightly control calories, sure, calories are number one, but everybody's friggin' hungry, right? Everybody on the low calorie arm is starving. So those are absolutely worthless outside of a metabolic board. But if you look at any ad lib study where humans or animals ate to satiety, 
um, protein percent is just always number one. There's, there's, th nobody can really argue with that, even from a evidence-based perspective. And that's, that's why I'm really all in on this PE ratio. Ted, I want to, um, <clears throat> I, I think, and we, we've kind of discussed this a little bit before, but do you, do you find that, uh, you know, at different stages of sort of adiposity, that there's different ways you can apply this PE ratio? Like I said, you like you and I, we're already at healthy body fat levels. I mean, we're relatively lean, you know, same, same with Zach, same with you know, these guys. And, and it becomes uh, a different sort of metric when you're trying to get, as you, as you mentioned, trying to get super lean, trying to get down to sub 10% body fat is challenging and not very, uh, you know, satisfying. And, and, and is that a different approach to somebody who say, you know, 50 pounds overweight and they're, they're sitting at body fat of 30, 40% or something like that. How do you, how do you, how do you differ between those two, two sort of types of people? Yeah, well, definitely. There's a lot of factors there. First of all, you know, if you're 500 pounds, you could just not eat for a year and you're, you're basically going to be fine. Uh, but if you're, you know, 10% body fat fitness uh, model, aesthetic athlete, and you're trying to get down to 4%, uh, now you have to eat a lot of protein every day, multiple times a day, so you don't lose lean mass. So the, the thinner you are, the less calories you can harvest from fat because your fat mass is so low, you're gonna get maybe 60 calories per kilogram of body fat. And as you get leaner and leaner, you're not gonna get as many calories. And the next thing on the chopping block is your lean mass to be converted into glucose just to keep you alive. So you really have to eat lower PE ratios, more energy with your protein as you get leaner and leaner and leaner. Uh, <clears throat> versus somebody who's hugely overweight could literally do a protein sparing modified fast for months where they're just eating a can of tuna and a salad or something like this. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. You can get away with higher PE ratios, the more overweight you are, you have to eat more energy, the leaner you are. And then activity level blows the PE ratio out of the water. If you're running a a uh, marathon every day, you're going to have a very low PE ratio because you have to just consume so much energy. So uh, yeah, activity level is a big factor. Uh, how obese you are is a big factor. And that's why I never really prescribe uh, an actual number, a PE number to anyone. The, the whole point of it, the whole concept is if you're not where you want to be, take your general PE ratio that you're achieving with your food choices and bump it up a little bit and see what happens. You know what I'm saying? That's the whole, that's the whole idea. The whole point of this book is find out what, be aware of your PE ratio, raise it a little bit and you can just slowly progress it. Yeah. And I, just to clarify for people that may not be familiar, I mean, you know, protein is protein and then energy is either carbs or fat. I mean, there's, there's, you know, those are, or maybe some people would argue alcohol potentially, but uh, you know, you've got those sort of metrics. And so are you finding differences on the energy side, carbs versus fat? Is there any, is there any different sort of concerns we need to have about that? I mean, obviously fat is more calorically dense given, given the amount of, you know, volume or the grams you might eat, but is there qualitatively any sort of major differences between carbohydrates and fats with regard to getting our energy? Well, if you zoom way, way out, both carbs and fats are really just high energy carbon-carbon bonds that plants have created as a way to store solar energy as chemical energy. So you're really just breaking these high energy carbon-carbon bonds that are stored solar energy as chemical energy. But on a practical level, carbs and fats are radically different inside your body. Carbohydrate is water soluble and fat is not water soluble. So you have two completely separate storage compartments you have two completely different ways of accessing and transporting these energies throughout your body. Uh, and they're radically different. You also have a hundred times more room to store fat than you do carbohydrate. Uh, carbohydrate is this sort of jet fuel that you can burn six times faster to get energy out of. So it's your emer emergency fuel of choice. And when you're running for your life, you're burning a hundred percent pure glucose. But then fat is much smaller and lighter. It's six times smaller and lighter. So your body radically prefers to carry it around uh, as an energy source. And so there are these huge differences 
in carbs versus fat in terms of storage size and weight and speed. And so you have, you know, 99% of your energy is fat, 1% is glucose, glycogen, but the glycogen is jet fuel and you use it for emergencies because it's so fast. Uh, so there, there's a whole bunch of really subtle distinctions between the two, and it's really good to be aware of these differences. And we, we talk a lot about the differences between the two in this book. I think on a practical level, another big difference is that when you eat glucose, your liver has to uh, suck all of it out of your bloodstream and buffer you from a toxic glucose load. So your liver absorbs all this glucose and slowly releases it. And the practical upshoot of that is that your blood sugar is constantly falling when you're fueled by carbohydrates and glucose. And some people are susceptible to this sensation of falling glucose and it makes them hungry and they want to eat again to replenish glucose. And that's really how we ended up at the point where your average American is eating eight times a day, every two hours in a 16 hour eating window, eating about 300 grams of carbs. So uh, I think you get a lot of glucose dependence and a lot of people feeling uncomfortable as their blood sugar is falling and then nobody's fat adapted and you pretty much get to the point where you have to carry a snack with you everywhere you go. And we're, we're trying to fight back against that in this book. And we're like, hey, okay, carbs and fats are both just energy, but uh, maybe you should lower your carbohydrate frequency so you're not as dependent on exogenous glucose. So you don't have to basically have a snack every two hours like uh, you're in preschool. You know, it's just really not cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's like really context specific too. And I think that's where people a lot of times miss it is they think, well, if so-and-so is doing this, then then that's what I should do. And then they find themselves in a completely different context and it works, works way differently than, um, I want to hop back quick to, uh, the, the comparison before when you were talking about someone who is already lean and then they're trying to get leaner yet for whatever reason. And then someone who is morbidly obese, who, uh, is trying to lose weight essentially for longevity, I would imagine as well as quality of life. Uh, I'm kind of curious about what's going on kind of physiologically with those two very different individuals when you kind of start implementing a, a fairly similar nutrition approach where, uh, you know, you're, you're cutting out the energy so they burn body fat, but you're keeping protein levels high or relatively high. The person who's lean uh, is going to be probably hungry, irritable, um, you know, it's going to be a, a pretty miserable, I would have pretty miserable experience and which is why most people aren't trying to sit around at those freakishly low body fat percentages for very long. Uh, but I'm more curious about the 500 pound person who could essentially fast or do a protein sparing fast for upwards to a year. Are they getting to like a point at that where they're just not hungry because their body is like, okay, the fuel's here. The protein requirements are here. Uh, we're just moving the scale down now, or do they also experience some of these kind of like hunger pangs or irritability from lack of access of exogenous fuel sources? Well, okay, when I look at the, you know, very lean person trying to get leaner or the super overweight person trying to get leaner, to me, both these people are gonna have identical protein and mineral requirements. And to be optimally healthy and optimally function at all times, I think both of these individuals should probably be eating protein and minerals. And the only difference I see between them is that the lean person needs more dietary energy and the obese person doesn't need any dietary energy at all, carbs or fats. And that's part of why I really like these protein sparing modified fasts or even something that's sort of approaching a protein sparing, uh, protein sparing modified fast like a you know, eating two grams of protein to one gram of energy, for example, or something in that direction, because you really probably have the same protein and mineral needs as a lean person. You just don't need any dietary energy, any at all. Some of these people are awash in energy toxicity. Their glucose is high all the time and their triglycerides are high all the time because none of their cells want any energy at all. They might even have a dangerous amount of energy toxicity at all times. And the last thing they want to do is eat any dietary energy at all. So I love a sort of high PE protein sparing modified uh, fast approach in these people. You're getting what you need, the protein and minerals, so you don't have to catabolize lean mass. 
but you're not ingesting any energy because you're already so awash in energy that you might have, you know, dangerously severe energy toxicity. Ted, I'm going to, I'm, I think well, there's so many ways we can go down. Let me, let's dispel a couple of myths, first of all. So uh, you are, I would assume, an advocate of a higher protein diet than the standard American diet, which is you, you've mentioned before is like 12 to 15 percent of our calories, which I think is abysmally low, but there's other people that are advocates even of lower. I mean, you know, there's people that say that, but one of the concerns we keep hearing, and in fact, there was a recent uh, you know, epidemiologic study came out, I saw in Medscape, you know, all us physicians are exposed to, you know, the, the Medscape propaganda, I would say, but, it, you know, again, questioning high protein diets are dangerous for the kidneys. Can you comment on uh, renal health and, and what you're seeing in your patients? And then more importantly, because we do see people with elevated creatinine, BUN, and sometimes, uh, you know, decreasing GFR, um, and, I, and I, I've looked at something called cystatin C. Can you comment on, on assessing renal function in people on high protein diets? And do they need to worry about knocking off their kidneys by eating too much protein? Okay, sure. <clears throat> well, first of all, we have zero case reports in the entire history of the bodybuilding community of high protein diets ever damaging anyone's kidneys. Zero, nothing, none at all. And that makes it pretty much impossible that a high protein diet is going to damage anyone with normal kidney function. There's also shockingly little evidence to support protein restriction in people who have kidney problems. This is something that just got grandfathered in. Um, and if you really look at the latest meta-analyses on protein restriction for renal dysfunction, it's, uh, it's really only beneficial in a tiny, tiny fraction of persons, uh, maybe 7% of kidney failure with primary glomerular disease. There was a tiny amount of benefit possibly in men, but not women in terms of protein restriction. But the vast majority, about 97% of people who have uh, kidney disease don't benefit at all from protein restriction. So protein restriction and kidney failure is mythical. The thought that too much protein is bad for your kidneys is purely mythical. It is true that your kidneys have to uh, work harder to get rid of um, the byproducts of metabolizing protein, but it's not true that that's harmful for your kidneys. High protein diets actually make your kidneys larger and stronger, just like your muscles and your bones. We now have evidence to support uh, high protein diets as improving bone size and strength, improving muscle size and strength, and improving kidney size and strength, if that's a thing. So saying that you should avoid protein to spare your kidneys would be like saying, I'm never going to walk or run or jump because that puts an incredible stress on my femur. I'm just going to ride around in a hover chair all day because you have, you know how much stress jumping puts on your femur? It's way too much. So look at this person with a broken leg, you know, they, they shouldn't be jumping at all. So nobody should jump. So that, that's kind of the mindset behind, uh, kidneys and protein. Yes, your kidney's working harder to excrete a high protein diet, and that makes your kidney better. It's like exercise. So, the whole idea that protein's bad for kidneys or bone for that matter is completely mythical, and we need to push back on that hard. There's really no evidence to support that at all. Uh, oh, I think you asked me something else that I'm Forget. Yeah, I was asking about, you know, because I've seen a lot of people, and they, 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 they go on a high protein diet. And in my case, it's often a meat based diet. And they'll, they'll say, hey, my creatinine's up a little bit, my BUN's up a little bit. And, you know, even sometimes they'll see the GFR, which is calculated based on creatinine, serum creatinine. And so, how are you, are you seeing that? And how are you sorting that out? Okay, so first of all, uh, high BUN in the setting of a normal creatinine, it means nothing. That really just means that you're eating probably adequate protein. When I see a patient with a normal creatinine and a high BUN, I'm excited. I'm happy. I feel like they're actually eating a reasonable amount of protein. So when you get lab results, uh, they're really just looking at a bell curve average of people who go to doctors and get their blood drawn. And the average, you know, elderly person in this country is only eating 60 grams of protein a day. They get their blood drawn way more than everyone else. They see doctors way more than everyone else. And so you end up with this normal range bell curve distribution for BUN that's way too low. 
And anyone eating a reasonably high protein diet is going to have a BUN higher than the normal range, which makes me very happy. That does not at all mean you have any kidney problem whatsoever. If you have a high BUN and a normal creatinine and glomerular filtration rate, that means absolutely nothing except you deserve a gold star for eating a homo sapien level of protein. Uh, so you can thoroughly ignore these elevated BUNs with normal creatinine and GFR. And, and secondly, nobody on a high protein diet is going to see a uh, negative impact on their kidney function. That's just not something that we see clinically. And, and again, we have no case reports of that. So there's zero evidence to support it. So don't worry about your high BUN. Um, you, you don't worry about your kidneys being damaged by a high protein diet. I remember in a previous episode, Sean, we were, I can't remember who we were talking to, but they were even saying like the, 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 uh, if you look back far enough to where humans were, early humans were eating more protein, like their abdominal cavities were actually wider to accommodate some of the larger kind of kidney and, and that sort of things. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's Neanderthal. I mean, they, they had, they had had a wider pelvic brim and wider abdomen and they, they had bigger organs to, to, to deal with that bigger kidneys. And what Ted, Ted's talking about, you know, with kidneys hypertrophying, I mean, we see when you have a nephrectomy, your other kidney gets bigger. When women get pregnant, their kidney gets bigger to accommodate the additional uh, stuff. So, I mean, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think the, I think Eskimo also uh, back when they were, were allowed to be called Eskimo also were noted to have relatively large, uh, kidneys and per perhaps even livers as well. Um, how do we do? Let me add, let's let's go from the kidneys to the liver now. So now we're eating a high protein diet, and now we've got this increased nitrogen load that we gotta we gotta deal with. And so we're you know we're gonna make ammonia, and then we're gonna and then we've got urea to deal with. Uh, what are we are we are we at uh, risk of ammonia toxicity with a high protein diet for a normal person? Well, for a healthy normal person, no. There are some very rare case reports of people with genetic issues where they have difficulty deaminating huge quantities of protein. So if you're some sort of rare genetic outlier, you might have an issue. Also, if you have advanced uh, cirrhosis and you're on some sort of liver transplant list, you could possibly eat enough protein to raise your ammonia to toxic levels. So yes, if you have, if, if you're not healthy to begin with, i.e. a, you know, a genetic problem or, or liver failure, then you're going to have problems. But you have to have pretty advanced cirrhosis. You have to, you know, drop your liver function by 70 or 80 percent before you're going to get to the point where you can't eat unlimited amounts of protein. So th this is really going to be edge cases. And these people probably do need to keep an eye on their ammonia levels. If, you, if you're on the liver transplant list, you're going to have to talk to your doctor and check your ammonia levels, but nobody else has to worry about this at all. Okay. And, and I know we've talked about this before in other podcasts, but it, it always bears uh, repetition because there's still many people that are distracted by this. You know, uh, you got folks like David Sinclair and, you know, the, all the plant based guys saying, you know, guys like uh, Longo and Al saying that protein is going to make you age. It's going to give you cancer via its, its uh, action on mTOR. Um, I think there's more nuance to that. What say you, Ted? If you really want to stimulate mTOR, just walk around fat all day long and have energy toxicity. That Your insulin level is going to be through the roof 100% of the time. And you're going to be stimulating mTOR 100% of the time because you're going to have crazy high blood sugar and triglycerides and insulin and energy toxicity. So just being overweight is going to be way more of a problem. Um, I, I, in a normal weight person, I really don't think that you're going to eat protein to the point that you're overstimulating mTOR. So I, I think that's really just a function of people eating too much in general. And I don't think it's the protein. I think it's the non-protein energy. I think that's really what the problem is. I mean, we definitely know that metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, or energy toxicity is driving all these chronic degenerative diseases. And I think that that's really just being over fat. And I don't think that's from eating too much protein. I think that's from eating uh, too low of a protein percentage in your diet, 
So you have to overeat energy to get enough protein. I think a low protein percent is uh, really at the heart of our problems. Let me, uh, let's touch on gluconeogenesis a little bit because you, you talked about, um, well, you talked about performance and carbs, carbs being rocket fuel, fuel and, and ultimately what we're looking at is glucose production. Now, I, as you probably know, I don't really consume any carbohydrates or, or almost none. And yet I have relatively high glucose. Some, some people alarm me say I'm going to die, die because of that. I, I disagree with that. I think there's other, other physiology going on there. But um, so we can make glucose via either, you know, you know, gluconeid, numerous, numerous sources, whether it's the glycerol molecule, whether it's certain uh, amino acids. Um, talk about the, uh, the you know, gluconeogenesis from a demand supply. Um, you know, is there, is there problems with gluconeogenesis, the glucose derived from gluconeogenesis, so on and so forth, if you, if you can. Okay, so first of all, <clears throat> your liver is making enough glucose to keep you alive 100% of the time. Gluconeogenesis is always happening 100% of the time, behind the scenes, in the background, you're constantly making all the glucose you need. And then when people eat carbs, that just raises glucose on top of that. So gluconeogenesis is uh, constant, it's unavoidable, it's always happening, it's always providing all the glucose you need. And if you eat more protein, it's not going to raise your blood sugar because gluconeogenesis is not supply driven. So if you eat excess protein, you deaminate the protein, you oxidize the uh, carbon skeletons uh, just the same way you would burn any other substrate in your mitochondria, and you're not going to raise your blood sugar. It's, um, it's something that people have been afraid of for a long time. Okay, too much protein is going to spike my blood sugar. But, you know, get out your, get out your continuous glucose monitor and just eat a couple pounds of uh, chicken breast and see what happens. You're not going to raise your blood sugar at all. So it's really not something that anybody has to worry about. It's not even... It's, yeah, it's just basically never a problem. It's, uh, it's kind of mythical that we need to even worry about it. So does but, that hold up for, for type 2 diabetics? Because we see that some will, uh, particularly early on, I see this in a carnivore diet, early on they'll see increased glucose. And my speculation is because, you know, they're so insulin resistant, they have a hard time getting that blood glucose into the cell because they don't have a way to transport it. So they have to overcome that diffusion grade because there's non-insulin dependent glucose transporters that would just work on diffusion basically. And so my theory is to, to, to power their cells on the glucose they need, they have, they need to, they require to have a higher blood glucose level. And I just wonder if that's what their, their sort of baseline is. And until that sort of levels out until that insulin resistance improves that initially they see a, a you know, a slight elevation in blood glucose. And we're not talking 180, 200, we're seeing 130, 120. Any thoughts on that sort of crazy theory? Well, uh, two things. First of all, so you're raising the, the glu glucagon and insulin simultaneously with protein. And with a type 2 diabetic with severe insulin resistance, you might see some issues with the glucagon to insulin ratio, i.e. you're raising gluco uh, glucagon normally. Um, you're raising insulin, but since you're so insulin resistant, you're not seeing the effect of insulin. And then the practical upshoot is that your blood sugar might go up a little bit. But Instead of just um, converting a bunch of protein to glucose, what you've really done is alter the glucagon to insulin ratio. The other thing is the amount of fat that comes along with that protein. In other words, if you, if you take a type 2 diabetic and you feed them a whole bunch of extra fat, their blood sugar will just slowly go up. Like the next morning, they'll have a really high blood sugar. If you're a type 2 diabetic and your fasting morning blood sugar is usually 130, and then you just eat a whole bucket of lard one day. The next morning, you're going to wake up with a blood sugar of 190 because uh, this fat has to go somewhere. And then your cells, your, all your adipocytes have to expand slightly, and they go from being highly insulin resistant to extremely highly insulin resistant. So part of the blood sugar elevation is how much fat came along with that protein. Another part of it is just um, glucagon to insulin ratio when you're insulin resistant. You might be seeing more of the glucagon effects and less of the insulin effects. So it, it gets really complicated. But once again, I don't think that gluconeogenesis itself is the primary 
problem there. It's really just more energy, more energy toxicity, which gives you more cell refusal of energy and higher glucose, or the glucagon to insulin um, differences that you get with severe insulin resistance. All right, folks, this episode of Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a meat delivery company that brings you high quality beef, chicken, pork, salmon, and scallops. What does this mean? All products are natural and humanely raised or sustainably wild caught, as is the case with their salmon and scallops. If you are concerned with how the animals you eat were raised, rest assured, ButcherBox partners with farmers who are inspired by Dr. Temple Grandin, a member of the Humane Farm Animal Care Program's scientific committee. Their beef is 100% grass-fed and grass-finished. The chicken is organic and the pork is heritage breed with no added sugar. So head over to ButcherBox.com and place an order today. And don't forget to enter promo code HPO for a discount. Thank you for supporting one of our long-standing sponsors. Now, back to the show. One, one quick follow-up, Ted, from what you said before, because I had heard once that, and this could be completely wrong, that uh, gluconeogenesis with protein is only going to occur if your, your glycogen stores are relatively low or low. But you, th- you said that that's going to happen almost regardless, even if uh, you kind of have stable... Uh, liver and muscle glycogen levels. And then um, what happens if your liver and muscle glycogens are completely like saturated? What happens with uh, that process then? Well, you're always making enough glucose to keep yourself alive. Uh, it, it's just sort of this basal gluconeogenesis that pretty much never stops. And then it, it, you're asking if you completely super saturated liver and muscle glycogen, well, then you would still continue to make enough glucose to stay alive. And then if you ate more carbs on top of that, your blood sugar would just go up and you'd be functionally diabetic. Okay. Um, another question too, because I think this is really interesting, the whole gluconeogenesis stuff. And I, I, I had a conversation on Twitter a while back that you were included in at some point. I'm sure you've forgotten about it now because it was a while ago, but it was along the lines of, how much faith can we put in the process of gluconeogenesis to keep our, uh, our, our glycogen stores full enough to do certain activities. And I think the conversation was something, well, it's very context specific. So someone like Sean, who is going to go hit the gym incredibly hard or you as well, but maybe not have a long duration workout probably has enough time between sessions to, to lean on that quite heavily, if not inclusively like in Sean's case, but then someone like myself who is going to find this kind of gray area of intensity is what I like to call it, where I'm going just fast enough where I'm going to tap into muscle glycogen, but just slow enough that I can do it for quite some time. And in some cases when I'm really fit, you know, hours on end, uh, how much faith could someone like me put in muscle or gluconeogenesis versus kind of needing to supplement with the rocket fuel or jet fuel, as you call it in certain activities? Okay, so um, let's, let's use you for an example. Um, uh, if you did some extreme carb depletion where you ate absolutely no carbs and you exercised with the highest intensity you possibly could on top of that, and just dep- if you just wrung every bit of glycogen you could out of your muscles by eating no carbs and just sprinting all day long, and then you carb loaded and just ate, you know, a thousand grams of carbs. You could shove the very, very most amount of glycogen you possibly could in your muscles. And if we're going to call that a hundred percent of the very, very, very most glycogen you could possibly have in your muscles from severe uh, dietary and exercise uh, glycogen depletion followed by a huge glycogen load, if that's a hundred percent, then when you just walk around fasted and not eating carbs and in, on a low carb diet, you're probably only going to have, you know, 25 or 30% of that um, depleted and then loaded carb uh, glycogen quantity in your muscles. So you're going to, you're literally going to look flatter. Um, if you're a professional natural bodybuilder, your muscles will visibly look smaller 
you literally can't sprint for as long as you could otherwise. You might be able to run a whole marathon very competitively in this glycogen depleted and then carb loaded high muscle glycogen state versus just living on a low carb diet when you're at you know 25 or 30 percent of the muscle glycogen you would have. Uh, you're not going to be able to run as far or for as long at a super high level of intensity, a glycolytic level, uh, where you're above your lactate threshold, where you're just burning mostly glucose. You're, you're physically not going to be able to do it. So I think that will be a big deal if you get to like a competitive marathon time or something like that, uh, where you w might actually benefit from eating carbs and having uh, more muscle glycogen. And again, it's just all about the duration of this effort. If you're trying to do a, you know, a hundred meter sprint that takes no time at all, then it's, it's literally not going to really matter. I mean, the carb might be a slight ergogenic aid, almost like caffeine would be, but other than that, you really don't need it. This is why Sean, I think can break these records, you know, on no carbs whatsoever, because it just doesn't, doesn't matter. You know, 30% uh, muscle glycogen of uh, being fully loaded is more than enough to, to uh, break records for short duration. But I think if you were trying to run a competitive marathon, especially if you had no food during, uh, you're going to really struggle to do that in a, on a low carb diet with no carbs at all. It's going to be a lot more difficult. Yeah, it's good stuff, Ted. I, I, I've, I've recently been in contact with an Olympic coach who's got a couple of his athletes on a carnivore diet. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to mention the names, but it's, it's competitive it's swimming. And they are setting records on, on, without carbs. So I don't know the distance. I, didn't, I, I forgot to ask how long it is. So it's probably one of the shorter. It's obviously not marathon swimming, but uh, that's a good point. Um, what, you know, do you, I know you said you don't touch into the protein exact ratios for per, per particular people but what is uh i mean you said something a human appropriate level of carbohydrates and to you what is what does that mean well if you look at um worldwide hunter gatherer macronutrient estimations they're at a protein to energy ratio of about one like one to one and they all have a protein percent uh average of about 33 percent protein but there's a really, 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 really big difference between carbs and fats in some of these different groups. You'll see radically higher carb, lower carb, higher fat, lower fat. But what they all have is just higher protein percent. And what they all have is a much higher, about three times the protein percentage of what we're eating in this country. And so I'm not entirely sure what level of carbs is uh, homo sapien appropriate. But what I do think is that uh, it's um, a higher protein percentage is what's uh, species appropriate for us. You know what I mean? Um, I think there's a little more latitude in the carbs versus fat, depending on, I guess latitude's the right word, because depending on what latitude your hunter-gatherer ancestors came from possibly, but the, the higher protein percent, I think, seems to be a bigger species-specific, species-appropriate factor. What about uh, the fact that many people will say <laughs> uh, protein is acidic, it's going to cause all kinds of problems, it's going to leach calcium from your bones, acidity is going to cause, I don't know, mucus, and you know, I mean, all the stuff inside. Do you have any thoughts on, on protein being acidic and, and, and the, all the horrors that, that come with, uh, you know, sulfur containing amino acids, so to speak. Oh, right. So for decades, there was this whole uh, acid ash theory and protein presented an acid load and you had to buffer it from your bones and protein was going to literally melt your bones. And this is all a giant flaming pile of crap. There's zero evidence to support this whatsoever. And in fact, the higher the protein in your diet, the better your bone density is going to be because your protein is not, uh, your bone is not just a stick of chalk. It's 50% protein. So half your bone is protein. And the more protein you eat, the better your bone density. All of this acid alkaline stuff is garbage. This is not evidence-based at all. One follow-up with that too, uh, with the bone content or protein content of bone 
is that like how how is that figured in or if at all to like our rdas for protein intake because one thing i'm always wondering about is like you know these people who are on these freakishly low protein diets i feel like as an athlete that is in a sport where you know stress fractures are very commonplace a lot of times you know endurance athletes it's not a question of if they'll ever get a stress fracture it's when they'll get a stress fracture is uh you know so for that reason, I usually target higher ranges of protein compared to like a lot of folks probably in the endurance in the endurance realm. Is that something worth worth thinking about, or what are your, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think this sort of protein is absolutely crucial for uh, repairing and maintaining lean mass. And in fact, we see people on low protein diets who have uh sarcopenia osteopenia and literally shrinkage of their organs if you're a low protein um vegan for example you're probably going to be at a higher risk for sarcopenia osteopenia and we literally see shrinkage and lower weight of organs including your your brain your kidneys your brain your liver these organs might actually be smaller now um a low protein diet, if you get your protein super, super low, you're going to be very, very thin. It's a good way to get the lowest weight possible. We see the very lowest weights in animals if they can get their protein down to 5% or lower. And the, the cost of uh, building uh, weight goes up exponentially as your protein percent gets lower. So if you want to be ultra, ultra thin, just go on the 30 banana a day diet and keep your protein down at around 5% or lower. And you're going to weigh the least, but that's mostly at the cost of lean mass. You're going to have low bone, low muscle, and low weight of all your organs, including your brain. So it's not a really good way to go. And then you've got like, uh, you know, Dr. McDougall, who had a fragility fracture and just fell and broke his hip. You know what I mean? This is not optimal, in my opinion, for... Um, uh, bone maintenance just to live a normal healthy life let alone being athletic ted could you comment a little bit on because this is this is a hot topic now uh protein quality in different sources you know and, and most obvious dichotomy is uh, animal source versus plant source protein right okay so animal protein is always of a higher quality than plant protein this is a scientific fact nobody can argue with this you have a more complete amino acid profile you have a higher protein density, uh, the proteins are more bioavailable. By any metric or any way of looking at it, protein quality is higher than animals than it is in plants. And this is just because they're at a higher trophic level. This is extremely basic science. So plants suck nitrogen out of the ground and make protein out of it, but they're limited as to how much nitrogen they can get because their roots only reach so far. Well, your cow can walk around and eat, you know, 10,000 blades of grass and then harvest all that nitrogen from all that grass and massively concentrate or bioaccumulate or biomagnify that nitrogen and that protein. And that's why you will have a radically higher nitrogen content and protein and mineral content of your animal food than you will your plant food. It's just a trophic level thing. I mean, it's just a straight binary, scientific, trophic level fact of life that animal foods is always of a higher protein and mineral nutrient density than plant foods. Higher quality, higher density, more bioavailable, uh, period. I really don't see how anyone can argue with that at all. There's just nothing else you can say. Yeah, you know, when I get into conversations with people about that sort of thing, too, you know, it's it, a lot of times it ends up or almost every time it ends up going so well, it comes down to volume of consumption, then while well, you can always overfeed on the plant proteins and make up the difference by by overeating. And I'm like, I guess to a degree, you can do that. But uh, I also where I, where they lose me with that, I should say, is if they're saying if, if we were in a conversation of like what's the most optimal way to go about things and to me that's like well let's focus on the things that do the best at their specific role and you know you're gonna have animal foods be doing that for certain things and you're gonna have plant foods probably doing that for other things and uh, you know when we look at it from which one is best at this specific thing and then mix and match that's where you kind of find that optimization side of things 
And uh, I haven't heard, heard any good answers to that or counters to that, I guess, maybe from the protein side of things. And other than just, you know, we're, we live in enough of a developed world where it shouldn't be an issue because I can always eat another bowl of lentils or something like that. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of huge problems with that. The first one is how much energy comes along with your protein. So, <clears throat> you know, everyone, you know, 88% of Americans have some degree of energy toxicity and are metabolically unhealthy as a result. And if you look at the amount of energy that you're required to ingest to get the same amount of protein, it goes up with plant foods compared to animal foods. In fact, if everybody went vegan tomorrow, if I just snap my fingers and we're all plant-based tomorrow, the amount of energy you have to eat to get the same amount of protein goes up by 40%. And what do you think is going to happen to the 88% of Americans who already have energy toxicity when they have to eat 40% more energy to get the same amount of protein? And that's not even looking at bioavailability. That's just looking at grams of protein, uh, you know, according to the nutritional database. And in reality, it's probably worse than that. So I have a huge problem with the protein dilution and the energy excess that you're forced to get from plant foods. That's just, uh, I, I see that as a, as a major, major obstacle to going plant-based. That's why when I have patients who are, are plant-based, I'm begging them to get some sort of protein supplement, you know, get some sort of plant protein powder and, you know, your pea protein, your rice protein, your hemp protein, and use that because you can get more protein with less of an energy load at the same time. There, and the other thing I, I have to say, okay, you really only have three goals when you're eating. There's three things you're trying to do when you eat. First of all, you're trying to get protein and minerals. You're basically trying to get the nutrients that you have to have to build your body and repair stuff. Secondly, you're eating to get energy, which in our modern society is so easy to do that we actually have too much energy and everyone has energy toxicity. The third thing you're trying to accomplish when you eat is to avoid toxins. You're trying to not eat something that's poisonous or is going to be bad for you or kill you. Now, if you're trying to get protein and minerals and avoid energy toxicity and avoid toxins, animal foods are really where it's at because most of our empty calorie energy um, comes from plants, your sugar flower oil. Most of your toxins come from plants. And animals have all your high quality protein and minerals. So for me, it's just a no brainer to preferentially choose animals over plants. Hey, Ted, let's, um, you know, obviously we've got plenty of energy and protein. We seem to have a dearth of protein in the food supply. Can we, I mean, can we on a mass scale get people to eat 30% protein? Is that, do you think that's feasible? I mean, how do, how do we do that given our current uh, food production system. Do you have any thoughts on that? I know that's a big topic, but uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I, 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 well, I love that question. And I honestly think that if you could get everybody to 30% of calories from protein, uh, we would see type 2 diabetes just gradually go away and be a thing of the past. So I love that. Um, and the answer is, no, you can't do it with just wandering down the grocery store and buying stuff. Um, you're just automatically screwed if you're eating what everybody else is eating. But once you understand this whole protein energy concept, and once you go out of your way to target protein and eat protein first, then yeah, you can, you can definitely do it. It's, it's actually pretty easy. And we have a lot of patients in the clinic who are um, just amping up their protein percent and automatically eating less, losing weight, having more energy, starting to exercise, totally reversing their diabetes, throwing all their meds in the trash. And it's all starting, honestly, with just targeting protein. Protein has to be the highlight of every meal. Protein has to be the highlight of every snack. And you're just going out of your way to get this protein first. And it, it, as long as you know what you're doing and you've, you're, you be, become aware of this, then it's, it's actually pretty easy to do. Do you have any, uh, because there's a lot of, uh, well, there's a lot of protein powders out there. There's a lot of, you know, and, and some people will say, um, you know, whey protein is a very, you know, whey protein is a very, very 
good on the on the sort of the dias scale and, and some of these things do you have any any concerns whether people are getting their protein from sort of isolates you know protein isolates versus food is there is there is there a preference for you yeah, I always think the isolates are suboptimal. Um, I think that you get higher satiety from chewing and eating real food than you do from drinking a protein shake. So the satiety is higher from real food. I also think that the minerals and other micronutrients are probably higher in real food than in some of these isolates. So I think all the way around, real food's better. Um, I... I do think that uh, use of a small amount of whey or something like that is fine. I think that that's okay. And that might even be a pretty good choice for some people at some time, just based on convenience and logistics and their lifestyle and that sort of thing. But I definitely don't want everyone getting, you know, bulk calories from whey shakes. I think that's definitely going to be suboptimal. So. Uh, but I agree that whey is a high quality protein source and there is uh, room for a little bit of that in some people's diet. Uh, I honestly think it's kind of overpriced, overhyped and not as good as real food. Um, but it's not, it's definitely not bad. And a lot of stuff in the food supply is bad. I want to, cause just in the room, a little bit in the running time, cause I mean, William Schufeld was part of the book and I, I you know, he, you and you and he both are share maybe a similar philosophy when it comes to, to training. I think you're, I mean, you're probably a little bit more on the calisthenic side than you and he is, but can you touch on the, uh, the, the fitness aspect of this? Because it's, you know, as you've said before, that's a huge lever exercise for all the sort of, you can't outrun a bad diet, but exercise is still very important. Can you talk a little bit on that and then how you like to, to, to sort of uh, make that happen? Yeah, I, I really think that, I think no matter what you do with your diet, you're only going to get halfway to the finish line. And the, the importance of physical activity is just massive. And if you ever want to prove that to yourself, just go to outer space for a couple of weeks and don't put any tension in any of your muscles or bones and see what the hell happens to you. Or just lay in bed in the ICU for two weeks without even moving and see what happens to your body composition and your muscle and your bone. I think that exercise is a full half of the equation. If you're trying to get the optimum body composition, the highest lean mass or the lowest fat mass, if you're trying to be as insulin sensitive and healthy, and optimally functioning, then you have to have um, exercise. But in the book, we really try to dumb it down to, you know, what is exercise? And at the end of the day, it is really nothing more than generating the highest tension you possibly can in your muscles for as long as you can possibly sustain it. You're really just trying to put maximum tension for maximum time in your muscles. And you can do that with machines, you can do that with free weights, you can do that with body weight, you could do that with friggin' isometrics, but the idea is just using your brain to put the highest amount of tension in your muscle groups as you possibly can. So in the book, we super dumb it down to just push, pull legs, maximum tension for maximum time. Uh, it doesn't have to be a huge time investment. You could do just you know a single set daily, which is one of our favorite patterns. But the idea is just maxing out the tension in your muscles. And there are so many people who never, ever, 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 ever put this kind of tension in their muscles, ever. They just, they stand all day in a position of least energy. They walk in a position of least energy. They sit all day. They're never generating this high tension in their muscles at all. And they just get huge amounts of atrophy as a result. The muscle just shrivels up and goes away because it's very expensive to maintain if you don't quote unquote need it. So we see just this mountain of osteopenia and sarcopenia because nobody ever generates maximum tension in their muscles because that's uncomfortable and people don't like to be uncomfortable. So in the book, we're like, get way out of your comfort zone, put the highest tension in all of your muscles as you possibly can for as long as you can, even that if that just takes five minutes a day. You know, we've got a workout in the book that takes, you know, seven minutes and puts maximum tension in all your muscles. And it stresses both your uh, muscles in terms of resistance and cardio 
And uh, there's, there's a, not a lot of excuses not to do this. And once you understand how easy it is and how powerful it is and how crucial it is, it's pretty easy to incorporate. And so we're just trying to really dumb it down to like, hey, put this maximum tension in your muscles because otherwise you're going to, you're going to lose it. There's uh there's some people that, well, I mean, what are your thoughts on the satiety of protein versus the satiety of fat? I mean, there's a little bit of controversy within my little carnivore community. Some people are, are all in on higher protein. Other people are all in on the sort of the ketogenic ratios. Um, do you, do you find that there's good evidence one way or the other to support which is a more satiating uh, macronutrient or do we know that? Well, it, it's really tough to go <clears throat> subjectively because honestly, you get a massive amount of satiety short term from carbs. So, uh, you know, if you eat a donut, you get a huge amount of satiety for about an hour. It's probably the most satiating thing you could eat. But then three or four hours later, you're literally hungrier than if you never ate to begin with. So you got to be careful with this subjective satiety stuff. If I eat a whole stick of butter, I am going to have a lot of satiety. But if I haven't eaten protein all day long, you know, how hungry am I going to be 12 hours later or 24 hours later? So I have a lot of trouble with people online who are gauging their satiety subjectively. And, uh, you know, what would give me the highest satiety, just massively overeating pizza and donuts, right? <laughs> you know, if I just like double my calories and eat a bunch of crap, I'm going to get the highest satiety. So if I say, okay, this is the optimal diet, I've designed the optimal diet, it's just massively overeating donuts and pizza, because it gave me a lot of satiety. That's kind of crap, like no one that's not valuable to anyone. So you have to be careful with how you feel how much satiety you feel from this. Because the, the most satiety is just hit, hitting the buffet and massively overeating. So I, I, I don't think that's going to really help us. Like short-term subjective satiety telling you to eat more fat than protein, for example, I don't think that's going to be uh, uniquely helpful. Now, if somebody was tracking their body fat percent and uh, being really scientific with their macros and found something that allowed them to eat you know, slightly less energy every day and lose a bunch of body fat. Okay. That I would probably pay more attention to, but it's kind of hard to do that. What, what, when we look at these studies that look at satiety, are they simply just doing it subjectively like that where they're feeding people something and then waiting until they report getting hungry and want to eat again? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> frequently they're doing, uh, we have, you know, preload studies where you give people a snack and then two hours later they hit the buffet and you weigh and measure how much they eat. And of course, protein scores the highest uh, in terms of a preload, you're definitely going to eat the least later. Um, and then we have some studies that, uh, you know, like Raubenheimer and Simpson, the protein leverage guys did this giant meta analysis where they looked at a uh, 150 studies where people ate ad lib amounts of food. And then, uh, but someone was tracking their macros, and you do find the very, very highest long term satiety. In other words, you're going to eat the very least at about two grams of protein to one gram of energy, um, like two grams of protein, one gram of fat and a fairly low carbohydrate diet is your very highest satiety according to that meta-analysis. And that's basically just eating like ground beef. That's eating just like a cow or something. Um, so uh, I, so the, the, what I haven't seen is a really, really well-designed long-term study where someone found exactly what protein percent gave you the most satiety but honestly i think the higher you went the more satiety you get all the way up to maybe 50 percent or so it's interesting i think it seems like with satiety given what we know you're you kind of need to do an n equals one experiment to a degree but keeping kind of protein as the focus and then uh, ignoring people on Twitter saying that this and that is more <laughs> satiating. It's so hard to, it's so subjective and it's so hard to do on a, you know, any kind of scientific level. I mean, you, you really just have to, you know, look in the mirror and see how your clothes fit every day for a year. And then maybe you could sort of get an idea for what macro spreads going to make you the thinnest, you know, but it's just so, so hard to do subjectively. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I've got one, one other question, uh, Ted, that kind of takes us back to where we started in the beginning with uh, just these nutritional studies. And like Sean said, we had uh, Professor Gordon Guyatt on the show, and he's, he's well known for the, that grade system of like looking at uh, quality of evidence. And when you put the grade system in place for nutritional studies, they routinely, if not always, rank really, really low. And the kind of counter to that has been, from what I've seen, I haven't done like a ton of research into this or any, by any means, but the counter to that is it's just not a good measure within the world of nutrition because there's just too many variances within nutritional sciences versus some of the other stuff like um, medication and things like that. Do you think personally like the grade is good, bad, or is there a little more to it than just saying good or bad when it comes to analyzing the quality of nutritional studies? Well, I think that, if you're looking at epidemiological studies, they're pretty much mostly garbage. Um, it, it's extraordinarily rare that we see an epidemiological study that gives you an odds ratio of two or higher, which is really what you need to even get any kind of signal to noise ratio out of them. So I would say 99% of the epidemiological studies I've looked at were basically garbage and you really couldn't glean anything out of them, except maybe a direction for further study with a well-designed randomized clinical trial. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. the vast majority of all the epidemiology, nutritional research is crap and sub-worthless and uh, really just a giant smokescreen. It, it might actually be actively bad because people are trying desperately to get recommendations out of them when there's really nothing there. I mean, it's like, you know, if, if you graph out um, popsicle consumption and risk of sunburn, it's just this straight line through the roof. Like, so for, I'm pretty sure popsicles cause sunburn, right? Like no one should eat popsicles because you're going to get sunburned. The, the, the association uh, and the correlation is just such garbage that when you try to get something out of it, you're probably going in the wrong direction. And it's, it's, it's almost sub worthless it's almost worse than not having it at all yeah it's funny it's like sometimes i wonder if it would be better if like the general public didn't see the epidemiological studies so then the the actual scientists and researchers could take what they can pull from that and then put together real kind of more quality stuff and then show us that so we don't get hung up in this you know like 10 tweet thread of 15 studies that prove your point but they're all just you know low quality epidemiological stuff Right. And this is how we got, you know, eggs are good. Eggs are bad. No, eggs are good. No, they're definitely bad. And nobody at the end, after you hear enough of this, nobody cares. Nobody knows. We have zero idea what to eat. And so you just go eat a, eat some Hot Pockets or something like that. You know, it's like nobody knows. So uh, it, it's almost worse than no information. Yeah, I'm into that, Ted. I mean, I, I've I've been sort of saying that for quite a while now. I think the the, the, the unfortunate thing is we've and, and to be transparent, the uh, epidemiology makes up the vast bulk of our nutritional knowledge. I mean, this is because it's so hard to do these, you know, randomized control trials. Let me ask you, and I, I think we may have touched on this before, but I think it's also important metrics to measure, you know, for health because there's a lot of a lot of different people that will rely on homocysteine level, LDL cholesterol, inflammatory markers. Um, are there things that you think that are, that are worthwhile measuring for people when we're trying to assess health? Because you're a physician has access to, uh, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of labs throughout the year. And I mean, where are we, where, where do, where do we get the most bang from our buck when we're trying to figure out and assess how our, how we're doing as a, as a person? <clears throat> okay. Honestly, the longer I do this and the more research I do and the deeper I go into all this, the less and less I rely on lab tests, the less and less I like lab tests, the fewer and fewer lab tests I do. Uh, you know, I have access to this giant array of advanced uh, functional medicine stuff. And uh, more and more, I'm just pushing way back against all of this crap because it's not that helpful. It never changes my basic advice to anyone. And what the, if you zoom way out, the reality is anything that's making you thinner 
is going to improve every single parameter you can measure your insulin, your triglycerides, your cholesterol to HDL ratio. All these things are just going to get better and better and better as you get leaner. The one exception to that is total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, which is part of why most of us feel that these markers are basically crap, like totally worthless. So I'm, I'm really not doing a ton of advanced testing. It's not that helpful. Um, I think that, okay, so like take insulin, for example, you can check your fasting insulin level, lower is better, uh, but it's so labile and dynamic. If you just massively overeat for one day, you can increase your fasting insulin level by almost double. If you fast for a couple of days, you'll drop your fasting insulin in half. And because it's so dynamic and labile and rapidly changing, it's not that helpful to ch track over and over and over. I would much more want to know what's your pants size and which direction has that been going? How many notches you have on your belt? What's your waist circumference? So I I'm not really excited about a lot in terms of labs. The one thing that I do use is triglycerides. So if you get a fasting triglyceride level and you, you haven't drank coffee, you fasted for 12 hours, you just drank water, um, you were on your habitual diet prior, you can glean a lot of information from triglycerides. Your triglycerides, ideally elite triglycerides are gonna be under 70. And if you have triglycerides under 70 when you're fasting, um, you're a lot more likely to have low insulin and low body fat and be metabolically sensitive and be metabolically flexible uh, because you're not energy overloaded. Now, if your fasting triglycerides are over 100, if you're hitting triple digits on fasting triglycerides, you're probably in an energy overload state. And the reason these triglycerides are circulating over and over is because they don't have any place to go. Your fat cells don't want them. If you're really thin and you have deflated adipocytes, uh, your adipocytes just hoover the triglycerides right out of your bloodstream on the first pass. And so I love fasting triglycerides. It's a really, really, really important measure. Uh, and then the inverse of that is HDL. Basically, HDL versus body fat percent is almost a straight line, where the thinner you are, the higher HDL. So that's almost just the flip side of the triglyceride coin. So I love triglyceride to HDL ratio. I'm not really doing a lot of other fancy lab tests. I would say the majority of patients who walk in my office, the only things that are really cluing me into their metabolic health is waist circumference, uh, blood pressure, and triglyceride to HDL ratio. Those are my favorite things to be tracking. And uh, you want all of those as low as possible, except for your HDL, which you want higher. But um, <clears throat> I'm not, honestly, I'm not routinely doing a lot of other tests. I do do fasting glucose and A1C in everyone. Um, now that 52% of adult Americans are pre-diabetic or diabetic, that's, you know, <clears throat> definitely something I have to look at. But I'm getting most of my information from waist circumference and uh, just a basic off-the-shelf shelf lipid panel looking at triglycerides and HDL. And probably my favorite uh, parameter is triglycerides. Do you do any, uh, I mean, I know it's stuff to do in the doctor's office. I'm just trying to uh, grip dyna dynama dynamometry or any kind of assessments of function, you know, because I, you know, I would argue that we need to just re revamp how we, 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 uh, sort of evaluate patients. Is that something you can practically do in your office or do you just kind of eyeball people? How does that sort of work? All right. Well, so, <clears throat> you know, everybody on Medicare, we have to do this give up and go test where we watch you. We tell you to get out of a chair and walk across the room. And we're literally watching you do this. So, uh, you know, if you have to use both arms to push yourself up out of the chair to a standing position, you're in big trouble. If you're unsteady, if it takes you forever, if you walk really slow, uh, your morbidity and mortality goes way, way up. So this just sort of basic functional strength thing is huge. We don't have any um, objective strength measurements like a grip dynamometer, which would be awesome. I would love to do that, but we just don't have the equipment 
And, uh, you know, I work for a big hospital system where I just punch a clock and, and a lot of this stuff is standardized and we just don't have a way to do that. But I, I would love it. I mean, I, you know, I, I do, uh, you know, I do the, uh, I do a lot of firefighter physicals so for candidates and they have to do, you know, 25 push-ups, and they have to, uh, do 15 minutes on the, uh, treadmill and at a high incline and they have to do, you know, do all these Mets and all of this stuff in order to qualify. And I would love to see something like that for just everybody who walked through the door, because I think that's hugely important. Yeah, I agree, Ted. Um, like I said, unfortunately, I have to I have to jump out of here. But Ted, can you tell us a little bit more where people can get a copy of your new book, The Protein Energy Ratio, and where people can find you on social media and any upcoming events that you may be, I don't know if you're presenting, speaking this year or not. Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, uh, the book, unfortunately, it doesn't exist in a paper form because nobody wanted to pay to print that monstrosity. So it's, you know, it's 328 pages and like 500 full color photos and graphics and illustrations. So it's this ginormous uh, digital only book. You can download it in a PDF form from the PE diet as in protein energy, the PE diet.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ted Naiman. Uh, that's probably the best place to get a hold of me. And uh, William Schufelt, my co authors on Twitter as well. Awesome. Are, Ted. Are, Thanks are for, you, Ted, are you still ahead. doing the band thing? Are you still doing the, the, the band stuff? Oh, yeah. Now I'm just a sub bassist. So I, I, I'm doing way less of it. They, they got way too busy. And I just couldn't hang with, you know, 80 gigs a year. So now I'm just a sub, but I still play <laughs> occasionally. Okay. Any speaking this year? You guys, you doing anything? Oh, I any think I might be doing uh, Low Carb New York in uh, June with uh, – Trail Collegian and those those East Coasters. I might be going to that tentatively. Nice. nice. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I'll. I don't know. I don't know if they want a crazy carnivore there or not. But uh, I think they do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to see. I've got a, I've got a number of things coming up this year. Anyway, Ted, great. Zach, I guess we can shut this one down. Another good one. Uh, this one will go great. Uh, you know, I think there's uh, you got so much good information there, which I'm I'm in agreement of. You know, almost you know. 98.9 percent i think of what what you say i mean i think it's i think we're very, we're very well aligned on most things yeah um anyway great stuff zach unfortunately like i said i gotta go so all right yeah no, i'll see you to, i'll see you tomorrow zach right yep we'll, okay. we'll check in again but thanks again ted for coming on oh thank you for having me thank i really appreciate you guys and i love your podcast hey folks human performance outliers podcast is growing and due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.